who impacts them? Who actually creates whys in the road for them and really forces them to make decisions? The more we can understand about the influence of our buyers, those are great indicators as to where we need to be showing up in a real meaningful way. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rearview mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. Every month on the second Thursday, we've got a live Q&A to answer all your Profit First questions. There's a link in the show notes to sign up. I made it easier because the old system was too difficult. So check it out. Hope to chat with you and help you be more profitable. Today, we're going to talk about profitably scaling your business. Here's the reality of it. There are companies that have scaled into eight figures. And you know what? The business owner is working even harder and making even less. I am sure that is not the results you wanted, right? We don't want to scale to eight figures and then have to suffer with the drudgery. We should be making tons of profit at that point. And that's why it's important that you do it correctly. We're going to cover the seven factors today to help you to do that. I want you to profitably scale your business if that is what you want. Make sure that that is really what you want before you go on that journey. Our guest today is Trey Donovan. He has 15 years of experience in delivering scaling for B2B and B2C and e-companies. He helps businesses to do this from sub five figures to the eight figures. So he's got experience across it. He's worked with big companies like Hyatt, Cisco, Starbucks, and the LA Lakers, right? So clearly he knows what he's talking about. He's going to share his wisdom with us today. Let's get him on the show. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Trey Donovan. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks so much. Looking forward to this, Rocky. As am I. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Sure. Yeah, I'm co-founder and CRO here at Scale Factor. And and Scale Factor was really birthed out of a lot of experience working with small and mid-sized businesses. So I've had some experience in the past with different brands, Full Focus and others, where I got to work shoulder to shoulder and in the trenches with business owners, helping them to grow and scale their businesses. And that's really, again, where Scale Factor was born, because that's where we started to see indicators of things that were truly important that helped businesses to grow and scale. Others who are maybe in the same industry or same space that didn't scale really, really stood out, right? These were beacons that we said, look, there's something to this. And so really my experience has always been, since 2008 at least, always been shoulder to shoulder with kind of the small and mid-sized business owner. Sometimes that would be on a product or service, but for the last decade plus, it's been more of a consulting coaching role, really understanding what's holding them up 
what are those barriers to growth and scale and helping them overcome those. And you mentioned that you, you've been working with them. And I believe that came about from working with two people who've done a ton of work in this space, which is Michael Hyatt and Donald Miller. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Primarily, uh, my experience with Full Focus, which is Michael Hyatt's company, is where, you know, again, we had he has a program, Business Accelerator, and there was a lot of experience through that, both the, the designing of that and standing it up, but also getting to work with those business owners who came to him looking for guidance. And, you know, a lot of what Michael does is productivity oriented, which is really great, right? Kind of internal operations. I think we got, uh, by opening that door and helping them in those areas, we got exposed and were able to see some of the other areas as it relates to sales and marketing and kind of front end growth that were also very, very needed. And I know Donald just came out with a book recently on small business that really helps, actually a couple of books on small business that really simplify the way to look at business. I know he uses the airplane analogy there and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I use very similar analogies in trying to take off an airplane and knowing how much fuel you have and so forth. I'll admit he probably did a little bit better job than I did much more <laughs> detail, but I, I mean, they, they definitely stick and work. And I know he's got within his own system, a, it's a different version of the concepts of profit first. It's his version. And when he built it, I don't think he was aware of profit first. And he and Mike McAllowitz are actually friends. So there's no animosity. It's not one system's better than the other. It's the one that works for you. And, and that's kind of what you, you've you got to uh, to go with. So speaking of Profit First, how did you learn about Profit First? So I first uh, heard about Profit First. I was working with a client in Texas. Uh, they were in the service space and they had built a really great business, but they had actually had early on in that business's tenure some real struggles, the real challenges. And it was really because they weren't managing their you know, income, their profits in the right way. And so they were, of course, not paying themselves first, right? They were doing everything but that. So they were trying to grow this business, continuing to invest in time and energy and money and hiring and all the things necessary to grow. And yet at the end of the day, they're going, man, what's in this for me? You know, I mean, quite frankly, like I'm working so hard. I had dreams and aspirations when I set this business up to have more freedom, to have more income and impact than ever before. And yet I'm not feeling that, right? That's not how I would describe my day to day. And so that's originally where I heard about Profit First. And it took me down the rabbit hole of reading the book and, and really understanding what that what those principles that Mike created are all about. Um, it's a great system. And to be honest, I think most businesses feel that way. They don't all talk about it until they get to a certain size where they get to the point where they just have so much excess profit, it's not a big deal, I think. And and for most of those businesses, they literally have to get, they got to start pushing eight figures, you know, or high seven figures where that, if they make it that far and survive where it's not an issue. Did you see that show up in a lot of other businesses as well that you were working with, that concept? We did. Yeah, I, I certainly have. You know, one of the, we'll talk, hearing a little bit about the seven factors of scale. But one of the factors, it's actually the last factor, is scale your business through investments. One of the things I could see really clearly as a business grew, probably closer to those eight figures that you mentioned, definitely you know, well into the sevens, is we get to the end of the year. And as a business owner, I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow, I have a lot of profit here. What do I do with it? Right? And I think every business owner has a similar... Well, most business owners have a similar train of thought. And that is, I know where I can take this and I know what I'm going to get for it. I.e., I can walk down to a dealership, purchase a brand new vehicle for my business, and I know what I'm getting, right? I can literally write them a check and I can leave with four new wheels and tires underneath me. Well, sometimes it's not as clear in other areas of their business. You know, hey, if I take this profit and reinvest it in this area, what am I going to get? And so I do think there's also the other side of the fact where you have business owners who, as they grow and scale, you see them, you know, getting second and third homes and boats and vehicles and all these other things, because I think a lot of times it's what they know what they're going to get in return for that, right? There's no questions about what they're going to get when they make that investment versus they're not so confident in other areas. And I'm okay with them taking money out of the business and enjoying life. I just think it needs to be systematic. 
I think you also need to make sure there's enough reserve inside the company because what we have seen is it's a roller coaster ride. And Absolutely. it's you don't know when you're on the downswing. It comes out of left field. And and I think every single business owner goes to that. And if you're not prepared and you can't make it through the downslide, then that's when it isn't fun. So yeah. it was through all this work, working with them that you learned and not learned, but you learned the the principles that then led to the seven factors. So let's just kind of rip through it really quick. What are the seven factors? Yep. The seven factors of scale are exactly that. We noticed these uh, indicators or beacons primarily when we looked at businesses in the same space or vertical, right? You could have two service-based companies that serve the same client network, offer essentially the same services. One would be scaling. The other would be struggling to gain any traction and maybe even you know receding, going backwards. So what we started to notice was there was really seven key factors that led to scale. We use factors as an acronym to kind of make it easy to remember. So I'll just walk through them really quickly, as you mentioned, then we can come back and dive into the ones we want. But number one, find your buyer, right? F is find your buyer because we can know our buyer, but if we can't find more of our ideal buyer, we will not scale. So we have to be able to find more of our buyers. Second one is amplify your brand, right? So when we do identify who that buyer is, if we're going to go find more of them, we have to amplify our brand in the right spaces, in the right places, and in the right ways to be able to connect and, again, keep that wheel turning. The third one is create new revenue. Many times, we see where a, a business has a select product or service that they're offering that they may need to look at from a, a different angle, right? Maybe there needs to be a lower entry level to allow people to, to, to get across the bar easier. Maybe in a lot of cases, most often they need an upper tier level, right? Where they kind of have what I call the standard floor stop. And we'll, we'll talk about that more in the future. But a standard floor stop is, hey, we have a standard offer and 80 plus percent of our clients are there. And we never reimagine what it could look like to actually serve them in a deeper way and draw more revenue from possibly a less number of clients. So create new revenues, the third one. Fourth is team alignment. You know, how important is a scaling plan and growth if we don't have a team that's aligned to it? Fourth is, or, or next is operationalize your sales. Operationalize your sales is all about many times in a founder owner business, that founder or owner who started it is central to most of the revenue incoming, at least for a long period of time. Well, until they can truly operationalize those sales, they probably will remain somewhat connected and overly connected to the sales process. Repeating your sales motion is the next one, R. Repeating your sales motion is really all about creating a predictable, repeatable motion in your business to generate revenue. Whatever space you're in, product, service, or otherwise, from an initial prospect all the way through raving client, you want to have a process for that. So repeating your sales motion is key. And then the last one I already mentioned is scale your business through investment. So really looking at when we do grow the business, when it does scale, what do we do with those profits? How do we reinvest those to ignite more and more scale and allow us to continue to create impact? Do you have to do these in order or are they all somewhat... I, I can see some of them being in order, but are they building blocks? We typically find them going in that order. Now, there are select cases where someone really does know their buyer really well and they need more support in other areas, right? Team alignment or otherwise. Most often, though, we start in that order and go through them in that order because even those who say, yeah, on the surface, like I totally know who my customer is. Once we start to dig, it's very surface level, right? It's kind of the answer of, yeah, we serve businesses that are doing between, you know, 5 million in revenue and 25 million in revenue. Well, that is a filter, right? That that gets you closer, but is that really enough to say we truly know our buyer? It's not, right? We need a lot more of the demographics, psychographics, you know, functionally what's true, emotionally what's true, socially what's true about them and then globally, how do we know them in a way that uh, we can serve them? I find when you talk to most people, they're really stuck on kind of the niche demographic. In other words, you know, I work with business owners this size to this size or wh whatever it is, you know, 
within that that are maybe in a geography that maybe have problem X. What I find, and this has been really hard for me to always explain to referring partners is I know my psychographics, how I want them to behave. I don't always know where they're hanging out socially. And what has been really interesting is that when people show up from the podcast, I'm like, oh, here's a thing that I, and I, it comes out of left field. A lot of them tend to homeschool their kids. Interesting. I don't even know how that shows up through this podcast because I don't talk about it. I talk about it on my other one, but I don't talk about it. And yet we get a lot of people who are very interested in either homeschooling or, or different educational types of things. But it's not something most people talk about. And when I talk to my business owners, I don't think they think in those terms. They don't get to that level of depth because my biggest question at the end of the day for all of them, and, and tell me if I've got this wrong or how to better do this, is I want to go fishing where the fish are, okay? How do I determine where the fish are? And that sounds like what you're talking about with this first factor. Yeah, it is totally about bringing in more and more filters, right? Because on the surface, using your fish analogy, you know, if you're, if especially if you've already determined which fish you want to you want to fish for, right? You've picked out the type of fish. You're obviously going to know right off the bat: is this a saltwater fish or a freshwater fish? To use that analogy, right? So we're going to either head to the coast or we're going to head to some kind of inland waterway. So you can start with that may be like in our analogy here, that may be revenue, right? Okay, well, you know the rough revenue, but that's obviously not where you start, right? Or, or where you end. That's where you start. That's the biggest like, hey, this is the largest filter we can use. But we've got to start scaling that down. And to your point, I think it's all about looking for those fringe. I think you use the word fringe. What are those things that aren't on the surface? Because I can tell you, you know, just knowing the demographics of, okay, is this person, you know, a, a professional in a certain industry or field? What kind of degree do they have? Maybe we even look at what kind of personal income or revenue do they generate for themselves? Are they male, female? Are, are they, what age are they? You know, you can look at geographic, right? Are they in a certain geographical location? All these things are kind of, I would call more surface. But then when you start to talk psychographics, like attitudes and aspirations and activities and behaviors, you start to uncover things that you probably and most often are surprised by. To your point, what is this thing about homeschooling or kind of alternate education? Like that is not something you obviously set out to serve people in that space, but you start to correlate, right? The people that I serve really well tend to have these things true about them. And when you can start to uncover those, it just opens up your scope to then how you find more of them, right? To your point, where do these people hang out? Where do they congregate? Further on, you can start to look at, okay, what influences? What are my customers potentially watching? What are they reading? What do they listen to on a regular basis? Are they, you know, what are they being influenced by from a social media or even influencer standpoint? And then honestly, like who impacts them? Who actually creates whys in the road for them and really forces them to make decisions? The more we can understand about the influence of our buyers, those are great indicators as to where we need to be showing up in a real meaningful way. And what I have found is most seven-figure business owners are head down in their business, right? Or they're at their kids' events. Some of them go to the gym. That's where I end up with the podcast. Like they're driving or they're, they're working out or they're doing something that is outside the business, so to speak, that allows them the time to listen. But everyone's, you know, every owner who's listening has got to figure out where their buyers are hanging out and how to get in front of them. And I think that is literally one of the most difficult things to always figure out. And then I, I take it a step further is it, it not so much in my business, because I know their why for why they're coming to me is, mm -hmm. is their why for why they're coming to you for your product, you know, for example, if you're selling decks, why are they buying a deck? Oh, Cause they want a deck. No, they don't want the deck. They want the experience of the deck. And how are you, you essentially selling that or whatever it is, the clothing, 
You know, everyone's got a closet full of clothes and yet they go buy more. What are they looking for? And understanding what that is. And for some people, it's just retail therapy. Yeah, that's right. There is a lot of that for sure. I think, yeah, you're kind of pointing to, you know, the old adage of don't sell the vehicle, sell the destination idea, right? Typically, yeah, they're making that purchase or they're making that investment to feel a certain way, to have a certain kind of experience. There can be plenty of status in there for a lot of people, right? To present themselves in a certain way. But I think if we can understand how our customer is currently feeling wherever they're at today and how they're going to feel once they've interacted with our brand or our company, that's a great place to start, right? And so that's one of the things we help people do is let's understand how your customer is feeling today before their eyes are open to this solution that you offer, this product or service you offer. And then let's also look at after they've worked with you, what do they feel like? What does their new reality look like? Because if we can get clear on that, to your point, we can not so much focus on the exact product or service, but we can focus on what's that ideal outcome? How are they going to feel? What is their life going to look like? What does it allow, right? So many times, you know, in a business setting, they may be looking for more freedom or more income or more whatever. You know, every business or service or product offers something. And when you can truly understand what that is, it really helps you secondarily do what the second factor talks about in the seven factors of scale, which is amplify your brand, right? If we know how our customer feels now and we want them to feel a certain way at the end of this, how can we amplify our brand in the middle to help build that bridge between the current reality and the future destination that they have? Because if we can set up our brand as that middle bridge, we're going to get a lot of people traveling that roadway. How do you figure out how your customer feels or wants to feel? I think it's knowing them. The better you know them, the better you're going to understand those core feelings. A lot of customers, though, again, that we work with, this isn't a startup, right? This isn't like, oh, I think I have a good idea where I think this product is going to work. Typically, we're working with businesses that do have product market fit to a degree, right? They've helped people already. So one of the best ways we've seen to do this is simply to ask. If we're not asking our buyers questions that help us fill in these blanks, we're missing a massive opportunity, right? A lot of these customers or clients have already worked with us. They love what we've done for them. They're potentially raving fans. Go ask them, right? Hey, how did you feel before working with us? What was it like to work with us? How do you feel now that these things are in place, right? Just ask them. They'll be more than happy to share. And most often, we find out more from our customers than anywhere else, right? It's going to be better than paying for some kind of market research or anything like that. Just simply go ask your client. Most good marketing research companies want to talk to your clients anyway. It's true. So you can either pay them to do it or you can do it yourself. There you go. <laughs> so let's move on to the to the A, which is to amplify your brand. Can you explain how you do this? Amplifying your brand is all about, again, I, I use the bridge analogy. I'll keep with that. How do we build that bridge? So, you know, the pilings on the destination side where they currently are, are a lot different than the, the opposite side of that, right? So we, I think it's, you know, using this analogy, I think we can stick with it. I think it's going to work here. Uh, we'll see. But they're currently where they are and they're looking at a future. So the first part of that bridge probably needs to be talking to either a pain or a challenge that they have. Sometimes before we can even think about the destination, it's like what hurts right now, right? Because so many times as humans, we're motivated by pain. So we can begin to say, okay, how do we start? Maybe we start with the pain of that. Then we start to paint the picture of what a new reality could look like. Maybe we also paint the picture of how long this bridge is, right? Someone may, if they can't see the other end of that bridge, they may be not so interested in getting on board, right? They're like, man, I see this bridge going into the middle of nowhere. I don't know what's at the other end. So we certainly have to let them know, but we can also tell them how long this bridge is, right? Hey, through these steps, through this service, through this amount of time, this much investment, Whatever it is, you can have this destination. So a lot of times it's meeting them where they're at with whatever pain or challenge they have, painting the picture of the destination really well, and then being really clear about the pathway to get there. And it's not a new idea by any means, but you know, people don't pay for information. They pay and invest in organization and application. And so if you can paint the picture of what's ahead and you can show them in an organized way what steps are needed to get there, 
most likely they're willing to invest if if the pain is that bad or their desire for that new location is that is that great. So I think a lot of business owners struggle here in the marketing game. I, most I know most business owners do. There's twofold to this, and I I think part of it that they don't always realize is the most important is the destination, the transformation. The bridges you talk about, it's irrelevant in a sense, but I think, as you said, they need to feel confident that as they walk across your bridge across the chasm, it's not going to collapse under them, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But they don't actually care whether it's a suspension bridge or a swinging bridge or a... That's right. I, I don't even know the names of bridges. I think too often business owners sell the bridge. Mm-hmm. And the engineering behind the bridge and yep. the engineering behind the bridge and how they're the perfect bridge builders. <laughs> but what they don't sell is the destination, nor do they really sell the journey across the bridge, not the bridge itself. And I think that's where we get it. Wrong. Yep. Just I could not agree more. Just as much as we dig in and understand our customers' pains and challenges, we need to go to the other side of the bridge, the destination, and get as detailed as we possibly can about what's different about their life. And many times, I'll have uh, clients just just do this. You know, many times when we're talking about a particular offer or service, it's like, okay, what do you do? And, And they fill in the blank. It's normally like one or two sentences, right? This is what we do. Okay, what does it take for most businesses? to do that. Within that one sentence, there's probably, you know, 80, 100, 500 things that have to be true or have to be done in order to X, Y, or Z, right? Same thing needs to happen at the other end of that bridge. It's like, man, for us to have this desired destination, on the surface, you could just say these three things, more time, you know, more freedom, more money, whatever they are, fill in the blanks. But I would venture to say for any of those to be true, it's going to be a list that is extremely long of what would have to be true for those things to be reality. And the more we can understand what each and every one of those are, the better we can paint the picture of the destination, right? It's it's not, hey, we're, we're going to a particular island for vacation. That leaves a lot to the imagination. But if you can tell me every element of that island, what's the weather's like, right? What the what the accommodations are going to be like, what activities there are to do, what's the typical weather pattern, what can we do in the water versus out of the water? Are these, you know, experiential things led by others or am I doing these myself? The deeper you can get into that destination and leverage those things, right? They're not all at once, but leverage them here, leverage them there. You're going to start to understand to your point, man, it really seems like people who are interested in this particular uh, activity in this environment, in this destination are my ideal buyers. Well, then when you speak to that, you've got instant ears because those people are listening for those very things. So yeah, it goes for both ends of the spectrum. You have to be really detailed about both in order to understand your your client in a way that you can, again, grow and scale with them. So one of the things that I perceive I run up against is the emotions. And the biggest emotion, I think, is probably embarrassment. Because if I come to a business owner and I go, hey, you're at seven figures, I can take you to eight. They're excited. When I come to a business owner and go, you're at seven figures, but everyone in your company makes more than you and you don't have anything to show for this to bring back to your family, they don't want to necessarily talk about that part of it. There's the embarrassment of, hey, I built this seven-figure business, but I don't exactly know what I'm doing or how I got here. Like, might be a little bit of luck, might be the right market fit. But they struggle on the the admitting the financial side sometimes. And so yep. something we're still trying to figure out is how to make that easier. Yep. And I think most often than not, um, it comes from a good place. You know, even you look at something like, uh, what was the book that Simon Sinek wrote? Uh, Leaders Eat Last or something like that. You know, there can be a great mentality from leaders who um, they put themselves last in a lot of those situations. They're all in on this business growing and, and their team succeeding. And all those things are really, really good. But I think too many times I find business owners are not the ones getting the benefit that they truly deserve from the business that they created. And I say that in meaning that, you know, I think there's too many business owners that aren't 
getting the benefits that they ultimately desired when they started their business. They hope to get there someday, but they've kind of, in many cases, it's probably overly dramatic. They've sort of created a, a monster that they're having to feed, right, to keep going. But at all at the same time, it's coming out of themselves and they're getting more tired, more stressed, more overwhelmed. Uh, they can see less and less of the big picture vision because they're so deep in the business and the next thing uh, on the task list. And so, yeah, I think one of the ways we do that is really helping understand the six core reasons our customers need us and really being clear about that, right? What are those core challenges of why our customers truly need us? When we can be clear about that, we can get clear about also what we're doing. Because on the flip side of this, you've got a lot of businesses who are offering products and services and create uh, spending a lot of time and energy in areas of their business that don't always yield great results. And so there can be a large part of this that, is this serving us? If it's not, let's eliminate it. It could have been very critical for our first year in business or second year in business. We're six years into this thing. We're continuing to put time and effort into that. And it's not actually, A, leading us closer to our goals or B, serving our customers as well as it did, right? Our customer may have changed by this point. And yet we're still doing things like that. So I think it can be a real clarifier as far as, wow, if we're not doing kind of an internal audit on what are my customers' challenges and pain points, and does every single thing we do feed towards those and help them with those? If not, why not? And let's clean house accordingly. You know, it's funny. The tagline of Mike's book is transform your business from a cash eating monster to a money-making machine. <laughs> so the monster <laughs> analogy, I mean, and, and that's what happens. We hire too many people or the wrong people, or we we sign up. And before we started, we were talking about the excessive cost of certain software. We sign up for all these things that literally make, going back to the analogy, are plain too heavy. And it becomes very difficult for it to, uh, to continue to fly. You mentioned six, I think it was six core needs of our customers. Mm -hmm. Can you just list the six? I, we're not going to dig into them today, but I at least like to get them on the table. Yeah. Well, I'll use an example um, of someone we are recently working with, and this is in kind of a unique space, but they're in the uh, space of helping people meal plan. So they have a whole meal planning process. So it's a time-saving thing. It's, it's all kinds of things, but it's going to be unique for every business is what their six core reasons are, right? There's not a blanket fit, but hers were time savings, right? Working moms often have limited time for meal preparation. So it was time savings. It was convenience. These are ready-made recipes that are convenient for this mother or father to shop for and prepare. It was the simplified meal planning, right? We're going to create great meals, but with a very simple meal plan. And therefore, again, feeding convenience and time. Variety and creativity. That was the fourth one. It's like, hey, you know, people in her space may think of meal prepping as very bland and, and very, uh, hey, we're losing the joy of food in the process. No, we can be very creative in this process and offer a really wide range of options. The fifth was the fifth was stress reduction, right? Preparing meals from scratch doesn't have to be stressful or time consuming. It can be very easy and almost liberating for these individuals. And the sixth one was healthy. We can have a very healthy and balanced meal outline for our week in order to keep us healthy and meet some of the maybe physical or health goals that we have. And so those were six for, for that individual. They're going to be different for everyone. But I think it's, again, through the process of knowing our buyer better, we're going to be able to find out what these six are. That was very helpful. And I appreciate the story. Let's move on to the next one, because I love this one. It's, it's create new revenue. And you said to me before, 10% of your buyers will pay 10x more for your services. I love finding those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we relate this to a visual. And so for the for your listeners, I'll give a visual real quick. We have what we call a revenue expansion model. And so in your mind, think of a five-star property, right? Think about a high rise in the downtown of the nearest uh, metroplex that you live in or whatever. But a five-star property offers things at a lobby level. There's typically a mezzanine level. There's a standard floor kind of level. There's probably some kind of premium or club level. And there's most likely a penthouse level, right? So if we kind of think about our business in that way, we can talk about the creation of new or improved products. And so at the lobby level, think about um, myself, right? I'm in New York City. It's July. It's hot. Like 
I can tell you, I can find, you know, what comes to my mind is probably like a W or a nice hotel where I know if I go in their lobby, I'm going to get air conditioning, number one. I'll get space to maybe meet someone for a quick coffee. I may get free coffee, maybe a free cookie, free Wi-Fi, restrooms. You know, you think of these things that are value adds that cost me nothing, right? It's convenience for me. I can step off the street and get these things. We need the same things in our business. What are we doing in our business that is completely free, yet adding value to our unique buyers, right? Our ICP. Who? What are those things that we can be doing at a lobby level? Then we think about the mezzanine. Mezzanine is there's an exchange of value. In a lot of worlds, this might be a digital download for an email or a phone number. This could be a free assessment for an opportunity to quote a particular job. There's a million ways to slice it, but it's typically, hey, I'm going to give you quite a bit more value, but there's a small exchange of value from you as well. Then you've got the standard floor, and this is typically whatever product or service you offer. This is almost 80% of your client base probably is doing this with you, whatever that is, fill in the blank. Then your premium, uh, there's less and less businesses that offer premium and even less that offer any kind of penthouse. So many people get what I call stuck at the standard floor stop. They tend to get to that standard floor and then they just sort of like, hey, this is what we do. And so when they think about scale or growth, they're really the only thing that comes to mind is I need more people on my standard floor. So your business has real estate just like a real property does, right? And so you can only pack but so many people into a standard offer before you try to be creative and look at other ways. So what we found uh, to be true is, as you mentioned, 10% of your client base is willing to spend 10X to get more value. So whatever your standard is, think about, wow, how could I add more value for my clients in order for them to invest more? They're ready. They're willing. I just haven't showed them the way or connected the dots for them. Maybe it's a service you offer, but it's kind of a done with you service. It requires them to be engaged and maybe engaged over a period of time. What if I could just bundle it all up and say, look, give me this much information and I will go do all the work and bring it back to you completed. Maybe it's a version of that, a 10, 80, 10, where they're involved in the front 10%, the last 10%, but you're doing the 80% in the middle. Things like that offer them more value, reduce the stress and engagement from them, and they're willing to pay for it. But I think too many times business owners don't think through each level of their business and say, man, what are our opportunities? What could we be doing differently to encourage people? Or I even hesitate to use the word encourage, just simply show them, hey, this elevator has more floors. Did you realize there's a third and fourth floor and what are on those floors, right? I think so many times it's not about selling them up to the next floor. It's not about pushing them to do anything. It's simply letting them know it's available. And again, you'll find the 10% rule to be true. By the way, if you're downtown, the Conrad has a beautiful, beautiful lobby that you can hang out in, oversee the, uh, is it the West River? I don't, yeah, the West Side and in wonderful place. So yep. I think- There's plenty of those opportunities, right? And we all <laughs> cash in on them. We do that uh, in our day-to-day -day lives all over the place. So We do. So this is something that, a, I think it's emotional for some business owners. Nobody's ever going to pay me 10X, right? You see that a lot in the trades. You see it in the service industries and so forth. But if you look at this and realize, okay, they're going to pay me 10X, 10% of them, that means I could replace 90% of my customers with just these 10 and generate the seven, the same revenue. And my guess is, you could do it more efficiently. So you could actually be much more profitable. Not guaranteed. I mean, you have to look at that particular model for you. And again, I still think it comes down to emotion holding people back. And second, you don't, I, I will say this, you can't go from 1,000 to 10,000, but you can go from one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 10. Like you take jumps over time and you can get there. It comes down to working less, making more. And that literally for us is kind of what we love to help business owners find. The other thing is those people paying you 10X are your 
I'm going to say they're your best clients, but they're not your best clients because they pay you the most. They're your best clients because they bug you the least. Yep. And they get the most value. They're the ones that are raving fans. They're blown away by the product or service you offer. Yes. And if you can do that, your life becomes easier, more profitable, more fun. And honestly, the truth is, most businesses, when you look at their services, I would bet you that 30 to 40% of what they do is either actually more than that is actually losing them money. If they actually figured out all the resources, time and effort that went into it. And so you just have to figure out how to do this and move towards you are, it. You are 100% right on efficiency. I mean, the cost savings of elevating a current client versus going out in comparison to going out and getting or attracting a new client, it's not even close to the same, right? So if we have clients already that are paying us for a product or service, it is definitely in our best interest to, and it allows us to earn exponentially more by just simply investing less of, giving them more value, but in turn, we're serving less of them. And if we if we create the right product or offer, it actually does cost us less time process less investment to essentially serve them deeper. I would also point back to the you know, start of this conversation, the factor number one, find your buyer. In the process of finding buyers, again, we're going to know them. So I can't even tell you how to serve your client deeper if we don't know them deeper. But it's always going to behoove us. Instead of trying to cast a wider net, simply look at ways we can serve them deeper is going to always pay benefit because money, time, and resources are all going to be saved in the process. And they are all... Limited resources. That's right. So That's right. Let, let's kind of take the last four. I know they are all distinct, but let's just kind of a quick overview. And then if people really want to dig into them, let's tell them how they can do that. Yes. So when we move on further, um, you know, when we look at factor four, five, and six and moving forward on there, the next one is really when it comes to team alignment, right? We can create a great growth plan, but if our team isn't aligned to what that is, we're missing out, right? We're going to have this push and pull uh, and there's not going to be alignment. So when we look at team alignment, we look at achievement, you know, do we have the, the, cause we, let's say you and I are, are doing this together, right? You and I can be in perfect alignment. Uh, but if your team isn't aligned to what your vision is, we're never going to get off the launch pad. And so one of the things we have to look at is how do we relay then this vision to our team? How do we communicate it in a way that engages them, helps them understand the bigger picture? Because in many businesses, right, you've got the business owner who's thinking these ways. Not everyone in the business thinks this way, right? They may just be coming in to do their particular, you know, day-to-day -day operational things, and maybe they don't want to think about it it will always behoove you to at least let them know what's going on and paint the vision for them. So vision is huge in this. Uh, not only just like, hey, currently here's where we're at, but here's the opportunity that we recognize. Uh, this is what I recognize as a business owner and leader. And here's where I believe we can be better at this. So when it comes to achievement, that's going to be key. There's also accountability, right? Hey, if we are going to up-level ourselves, what opportunities do we need to explore as it relates to accountability? There's got to be KPIs and checks and balances to ensure that we're staying in alignment. Because one thing, again, hey, I talked to him about it six months ago. We're all in alignment. No, this is something that happens over and over, right? And we need to put in place accountability measures. And the last one is accessibility. If we're not providing ongoing training and development opportunities outside the organization and inside to explore opportunities of more accessibility to this idea, to the vision, we're going to have people that that fall off the wagon. And it, again, it's going to cause sideways energy that doesn't allow. So when it comes to team alignment, we look at those three primarily. And that makes a lot of sense. I've always talked about having your vision and your culture and all of that is a core foundation. It's the one we all skip. And then we wonder why we're stuck and not everyone is on our page because we didn't tell them what our page was and make it part of it. And then Five and six are all about sales, which is getting the business owner out of the sales model. I think too often they get out a little too early or they don't have a model to pass along to the next person. Because every business owner I talk to, they are always their best salesperson usually. That's right. 
And I think it's the latter. So I would argue most often it's because they haven't set up again, they haven't operationalized their sales. And as the next factor talks about, created a repeatable sales motion. And, you know, I'm certainly not someone who believes in uh, explicit scripts, follow this word for word, anything like that. But when a founder or owner creates a business from scratch, you know, I always think about business owners as like carving out a place in, in, into granite, right? This is never been, we are carving out a place in the market for, for this business to grow and thrive. They have the stories, right? They have all the context. They were there from day one. They know it better than anyone else. That will never change. We can't expect that to change. But what we can do is help them to take that from their mind between their ears and put it into a way that others can pick up and work with. And so, you know, in the operationalize your sales model, we talk about just the overall strategy. How do we, how does the owner think about sales? Is it solution selling? Is it value-based selling? You know, kind of what is their mode of, of operation when it comes to sales? Certainly sales goals, uh, things like that are super important. Um, coming up with a process uh, for that, right? Like, hey, how are we going to prospect? What is our prospecting look like? Are we going to do email marketing, content marketing? Is there social media that we do? Are we going to advertise with billboards or TV? Like, what is the, the actual process to that? And then ultimately, going through and really extracting from that owner typical sales conversations and how others can use their same terminology. Again, call forward maybe some of the same stories from the founder. Also, again, what's your story? What is you as a salesperson? When have you been in a situation like this? How did you overcome it? What were the results? You can use stories like that in, again, a situation like this. So it comes down to you know helping them handle objections and all those things. Obviously, there are technology things that are part of this too. Like, do we have a CRM? What is our process internally for managing our, our prospects and customers? And then what is our ongoing training? Those are all part of it. And I would say the last one, just like before is, monitor, measure, optimize. If we don't have some way for the owner, again, because I find a lot of owners are very hesitant to turn over some of these things because as you said, they're primarily responsible for generating revenue. So the fear level matches their engagement level, right? As soon as they think about handing any of this off, they go, well, man, what if we don't create as much revenue this next month because I'm not out there? That's going to be a problem. So they have to be really confident as they hand this off but also there needs to be monitor, measure, and optimize points in there as well to where they can at any time check in and know where things are at. So they can, again, calm those fears that I think are very natural. And I've said a million times, your business is a math equation. The first part of this math equation is leads, conversion rates, average sales value. All of that focuses in to how these things, we've got to put numbers to them. We've got to measure and we've got to see how they're changing and when they're changing. Yes. For sure. For sure. In fact, the next factor is exactly that. When we think about repeating the sales motion, we really have to think about what is the process that has worked for us up to this point from literally the first time someone drives past that billboard and picks up the phone, sees the social media ad, gets the mailer in the mail, whatever your thing is where you may initially um, you know, connect with someone, what is the process from there? And then also, what communication do we use? How do we introduce ourselves and our brand, right? How do we set expectations? How do we gather the necessary information? These types of things come naturally to who's in the place right now, right? Most commonly the business owner. It's just, they just do it. They don't think about it. They just do it. Hey, this is their introduction rolls off their tongue. They tell a history of the business, all the things. They're starting to gather things that set expectation. They're gathering key information. They're discovering and understanding pain points. All these things are just the way they do it. And yet they've never stopped to say, what are those things, right? How do I introduce myself? What are the key two or three sentences that I say after my brand name? What are the things that I ask for from the client as far as, hey, what are the expectations here in this sales call? Or I'm showing up to someone's doorstep and saying, hey, I'm here to look at X, Y, or Z. What are the expectations? They said, all these things are something that is habitual and, and rhythmic for an owner and yet have to be explicitly detailed and then taught or relayed to whoever's going to take it over. And I think too often, there's a real, real deep fear with that of just, I don't think it can be as good as when I, and I'll tell you where businesses, business owners struggle with this the most is if they can't get over that fear. If they're simply in the seat of no one can do, do it like me, then guess what? 
No one will do it like you. And you'll continue to be in the same place in the next year, three years, five years. But if you can say, you know what? I believe there's a way to pull this out of my head, put it into a manner that someone else could pick it up. They're not going to do it the same as me. That cannot be the bar set is they're going to do it just like me. What I am saying is we can get to the same end by using a lot of the same exact methods that I use. It just has to be clear. And I think that principle applies to every part of the business. How do we get it out of the business owner's head? Mm-hmm. And into the people so they can go do it. So you are not doing everything and running around with your hair on fire and being the problem of the business. Yep. And, and it yep. doesn't matter what we're talking about. It goes yep. through every part of it. And, you know, some salespeople could probably outsell you by double, but we won't go there today. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what? I have, um, I was going to say never. I can't think of any business owner that I've ever worked with that's been super upset when someone they've taught their, uh, again, their sales methodology or their sales operation has exceeded their expectations and their wildest dreams and are closing, you know, a hundred times more than they are. No one's ever really upset about that, that I know of. I agree with you. So once we've taken all the steps, now we can finally scale the business and reinvest appropriately. I think too often, we're told you got to spend money to make money and people waste money and Mm. don't make money, unfortunately. Yep. Yeah. I think certainly when we look at reinvestment, the confidence in reinvestment has to be there. Otherwise, A, it's not done. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think too often I see business owners invest in things that they know what the return is. It's a physical return. I use the analogy of a vehicle, right? I can go down to the local car dealership. I can take the hard-earned money uh, from this year and I can give it to someone I know what I'm going to get in return. However, I think sometimes that's a default. That's a default because I'm not confident in where I can put it in my business to yield a result. And so I end up uh, investing in things that I do feel comfortable with. You and I also talked a little bit earlier about like, I am not at all against investing in vehicles, experiences, right? Things that benefit the owner uh, explicitly. That's great. That's awesome. I just never want it to be as a default because I don't quite know what else to do with it. And I've seen that happen too often. So yeah, we look at a couple different, when we look at investments, we look at first the opportunities, right? Hey, are we going to invest more in our products? Are we going to invest more in our services? Are we going to invest more in marketing or advertising, right? Digital or physical or otherwise? Uh, Is there infrastructure or technology things that we need to invest in? Is it more people, right? Talent uh, acquisition and development. Maybe it's uh, more like market expansion, partnerships that we haven't invested in up to this point. There's a lot of different ways, but we have to look at it kind of in those filters to say, okay, first and foremost, what are the investment opportunities that we have at our fingers before we even talk about more like, okay, what's my risk tolerance? And really, what am I, what's my commitment to this, right? Um, we have to really understand first the opportunities that are there in the, in the, projected returns that come from those. We've gone way over time, which is fine. I I thought it was important to do this. If people would like to learn more about you and how you help, what's the best way for them to do that? Our website, which tells a lot of the seven factors, there's a PDF download on there, is the scale factor. Uh, We also have a scalability assessment. So if there's any of your listeners who are business owners who are going, you know, how scalable is my business? I've always wondered that. I wonder how scalable it is. You can go to thescalefactor.com slash my score. About 13 minutes, we'll walk you through this whole assessment. We'll tell you not only your scalability score, we'll also measure your businesses against others in your same growth stage that are in scale and show you the delta of what's possible. And then the result is obviously what we believe a revenue and profit opportunity is for you. So yeah, either of those options will give people a lot better feel for what we do. Cool. We'll make sure to put those in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Here's the bottom line. You got to take action. So what are the one or two things that you heard today in scaling, regardless of whether or not you want to scale? that you can use in your business to make it easier, to make it more fun, to make it more profitable? Where do you need to spend time and with which clients that are going to pay you a lot more for your services than you're currently charging them? And you don't have to do much extra 
if anything at all? Who are those people who love you and want to hand you more money? Why don't you figure it out and go get it? Because I tell you, that's when business becomes really, really fun. And at the end of the day, you know what I'm going to tell you. You don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful in how you ask for those extra funds. And let's focus on the bottom line. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. This episode of the Profit Answer Man podcast is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. If you've discovered us via the network, then I hope you enjoy today's show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss our episodes. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.